India's naval marine commandos have come to the rescue of a hijacked ship in the Arabian Sea in a daring and dramatic operation. I'm Barkhadad, you're with the Mojo Story. Today we'll be looking at not just the dramatic and daring rescue op by the Indian Navy that has come to the rescue of a hijacked ship and brought to safety, safety all the crew members, including 15 Indians. We'll also be looking at the larger geopolitical questions that have arisen ever since the Navy enhanced surveillance in the Arabian Sea. Remember, India has deployed warships and missile destroyers ever since an escalated number of drone attacks targeted merchant ships most recently just under 250 nautical miles off the coast of Port Bantar. There are a lot of things and issues that these drone attacks, escalated targeted attacks by Iran-aligned Houthi groups raise. There are also strategic questions to be looked at, including India's refusal to be part of a US-led coalition in these waters. To talk about both this dramatic rescue operation by the naval Marcos, as well as the larger strategic questions that arise. Let's introduce our panel of experts today. I think we could not hope for a better panel of experts and veterans. Uh, let me first introduce on the program, uh, General Atta Hasnain. He's of course been the General Officer Commanding of the 15th Corps. Also welcoming to the program here at the Mojo Story is the former Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Ghormade. Welcome to the program, sir. Also joining us is Captain DK Sharma. Uh, he was quick off the bat to, uh, to release a video this morning telling us about the implications of this dramatic rescue. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure, sir. Also joining us to talk about the diplomatic ramifications it's Ambassador Dr. Mohit Kumar. As I mentioned, Dr. Kumar is out with a sterling new book. Do pick up a copy uh, if you haven't. And also joining us on the program, last but uh, never the least, is uh, Admiral Shekhar Sena. Uh, he is, of course, the chairman and trustee at the India uh, Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. And we'll be looking um, at those dramatic images released uh, by, the, by the Navy. I just want to start, uh, if I may, with Admiral Gormade. Uh, sir, tell us a little bit more about how this rescue operation happened? What would be the challenges? Uh, the elite Marcos, the Marine commandos at the forefront of this um, very proud moment, of course, for the Navy coming to the rescue of this hijacked ship. Uh, but it would have not been easy even for the agile, sure-footed Marine commandos. It, it's a risky op. Tell us what we know so far and what the larger questions this op raises uh, from a geopolitical point of view. Yeah, thank you, Barkha, uh, for, firstly, for inviting me. Uh, Indian Navy is committed for safety of seafarers and has been in this operation since 2008 when we had deployed ships of the Gulf of Aden. Uh, this present operation, uh, when uh, a post uh, on the UK MTO portal, a post was said that this uh, Liberian flagged uh, merchant bulk carrier was hijacked on in the evening of 4th January. Uh, Indian Navy deployed a maritime patrol aircraft immediately and also put in the surveillance through the MQ-9B, uh, the, uh, see, uh, the uh, UAV. And that particular uh, was uh, monitoring the ship continuously. Mm -hmm. The uh, MPA, that is the PHI, contacted the crew on board after overflying the bulk carrier on the fifth morning. The crew had uh, were actually these uh, all these merchant ships over the years. Uh, they are also being trained for handling this anti hijack. So they had gone into the citadel, and that was a good thing done by the crew. And they got in touch with our um, maritime patrol aircraft. Now at this time, the maritime patrol aircraft, uh, the PHI, warned the hijackers that there will be consequences. And uh, the ship, our uh, INS Chennai, guided missile destroyer, which was already mission deployed in that area, uh, swung into action and closed. The, uh, the crew on board this uh, bulk carrier had only the steering with them. They didn't have the propulsion control with them. So that was dangerous because the machinery compartments and all those areas, they were not available to them. But they did a northerly course and our ship, which was positioned also in the other direction, uh, did about 20 knots and it closed, they both uh, were closing each other. So that was a good 
uh, direction which the crew also chose and yes. with the warning which was given by the uh, aircraft our uh, aircraft crew or to the uh, hijackers they escaped this uh, the uh, from the uh, ship they just uh, they were warned that if there would be consequences so but you never know because when marine commandos land on this at this particular time there was air surveillance given by the uh, mq9 by predator and also by our uh, that is sea guardian yeah. our uh, the uh, uh, pi pi and also the on on board helicopters once they were giving this surveillance the marine commandos landed but now going inside the machinery compartments and other areas and sanitizing the whole entire bulk carrier which is such a large ship requires lots of effort and that was done by our daring uh, yes. Mary and and and, then, and and those dramatic videos have been released uh, there we can see some of those uh, those images and really it is uh, like something out of a movie those are of course uh, uh, generic images of uh, of the marcos not from this actual operation but the actual operation images are uh, extremely dramatic uh, as well including a drone perspective of this rescue operation now i want to play out uh, just in a moment uh, what some of the rescued crew Uh, had to say i think this was a very proud moment for all indians for the navy but i think for all indians uh, listen in and then i'll come to uh, admiral sina <laughs> so chance of bharat mata ki jai admiral sinha let me bring you in now the point is that as admiral uh, just explained here uh, gormare just explained here the uh, sea craft the, the 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 sort of aircraft and warships have been mission deployed for the last few weeks ever since the targeted uh, attacks on merchant ships the drone attacks on merchant ships including one off the coast of india uh, what do we make of what has happened and you know there's been some suggestion on our last program there were uh, some military veterans who said merchant ships have to protect themselves this cannot be india's job clearly that is not how india or the indian navy is thinking or responding go ahead uh, admiral sinha uh, thank you barkha i think first we have to realize that the the main primary role of the indian navy is to protect the sea lanes of communication this is the first task and our ships are deployed aircraft are deployed and submarine are deployed in that manner uh, you know they have seven areas they have chosen uh, where these are deployed 24/7 uh, either an aircraft or a ship or a submarine it's been declared it's it's known and uh, this area the gulf of aden remains uh, one of the important areas because it's a transit route for world's old trade almost 80% of the trade of the world is passing through this area and therefore our ship being there is not something new as vice chief forum vice chief pointed out 2008 onwards we have been deploying i also must bring out to your viewers uh, that the first ever shooting against a pirate ship was done in 2008 by a indian navy ship and it sank the pirate ship and then the case was of course that's a different story Uh, so we have been undertaking these daring missions the only one if i dare to say so uh, so far uh, that is one now why it happens see there are two reasons one is that as you recall uh, after the deployment of our ships on permanent basis uh, it had come down to a very large extent very few incidents were taking place but in last 2 uh, 3 weeks as you mentioned that we have had two hits on our ships headed for us and there is a third one which was being hijacked now i i sincerely hope that it has nothing to do with the israel hamas uh, war uh, which is having its impact in yemen and houthis right. uh, why i why i make this guess is because you know houthis are of course being funded by some countries who are who have financial sanction against them and therefore uh, it is quite possible that funding of these terror groups requires money and i have always felt that all this uh, you know issue of piracy of somalia is not that the somali pirates get all the money you know the all ransom money goes to some terror funding somewhere and uh, the the pirates are only a sort of pawns they just get 5 600 dollars maybe 1000 dollars each we have caught hold of them we have had a chat i have had a chat with some of them so i think that you know it is a uh, it will be wrong to say that it is only a piracy attack however 
because of what is happening in the red sea where you know drones are attacking the houthis are attacking the merchant ships mercilessly the the possible that the you know the pirates have taken a risk they have taken a chance you know that you know let's go and do some bit of piracy and as you know they came in a skiff and so, so can, I, can, I, can, can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you? Because we're looking at the Houthi. Can, I, can I just play the video again for a second? Because you mentioned the Houthi rebels and they have ignored the last warning, so to speak, from the Americans. And it is your submission, um, Admiral Sinha, that you don't think what has happened in the last few hours is just a case of piracy. You think somewhere it is linked to the Red Sea terror that is being inflicted by the, by, by the Houthis and that the Israel-Hamas war is now clearly making its impact felt uh, in the on the high seas admiral sena yeah i mean, I, I think there's the there's a great uh, geopolitical meaning behind this uh, because you know they require money to buy weapons and buy the ammunition and the money is not very easy to come by their funders the funders themselves are in uh, uh, you know on a sanction and therefore this piracy and these incidents increasing just along with what is happening in uh, you know in red sea is I I would think that it is not a coincidence. Maybe you know uh, Ambassador Mohan Kumar might throw some light on this, but I think that there certainly there is some linkages. If it was pure piracy, then you know it would have been a different story. If they wanted to hijack the ship, they would have hijacked the ship and asked for ransom. Where does the ransom money go? That's yeah. the point I'm making. Barbara. This is a very interesting question, and let's open this up now. General Hasnain, Dr. Kumar, Captain D.K. Sharma. General Hasnain, I'll start with you. Uh, I think a couple of interesting points. Uh, you know, uh, we had uh, the former vice chief uh, explain to us the operational aspects. Admiral Sinha raises the geopolitical question. Is this just piracy? Uh, is this Israel, Hamas being, uh, you know, the impact now expanding regionally? Uh, and that's already happening in a way. Americans issued what they called a last warning. That warning was ignored by Yemen's Houthi rebels who are Iran aligned. There's something more going on here. General Hasnain. Barga, thank you first of all for inviting me for your show. Couldn't agree more with the Admiral Sina. Some of Admiral Sina and I, you know, we work a lot on these issues of terror around the world, global linkages, etc. It may sound very exaggerated when I start telling you about this, but I think he's absolutely right. You see, out of the blue, this doesn't just come up like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are finding a range of activities which have suddenly come afloat uh, right from uh, Africa, from Eastern Africa, should I say, spreading right up to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Suddenly with this uh, emergence of the Hamas-Israeli conflict, lots and lots of things are happening. I mean, need not recount every event everywhere. But obviously, a geopolitical angle to this is very, very, is, is absolutely crystal clear almost. You see, we have seen the global cycle of terror almost coming to an end with, at the time of COVID, when COVID came. It mm. also signaled the end of ISIS, 2018-19, the finishing of Mosul operations, and things like that. <clears throat> Since then, I have been predicting a second cycle of global terror which will arise. And which mm -hmm. will probably have some kind of a spark which will bring this about. That's exactly what's happened with the Israel Hamas war. All these years, all this time in the last couple of years, the Houthi rebels, the Zaydis, or so so called other uh, proxies of Iran and people like that, we're all fighting it out in Yemen, right? Uh, money, huge amount of networks, financial networks are at the, at the crux of this entire thing. Why financial alone? Drug networks. Drug networks are hugely involved in this. And obviously, this for all this money is required. Now, the ISIS had a lot of money under its control when it was fighting in Mosul and all those areas. It couldn't have couldn't have kept on fighting unless it had more money. That money has to come from somewhere, as what Admiral Sinak very correctly says. And now, with the second cycle of terror rising, obviously, these are the kind of activities from where this money is coming into being, into effect. And that is why you're going to find a increasing, increasing phenomenon of these kind of activities, not just here, but in many other parts of these of Southwest so, so, Asia. So maybe. both you, so so General Hastain, you've made a big statement. You have said this is the beginning, not this particularly, but Israel Hamas has triggered the beginning of the second global cycle of terror. So both of you seem agreed that we are not looking at a hijacked ship through the prism of piracy alone. 
right? I think that's a very important point. I want Captain D.K. Sharma to jump in there because I would need to discuss the uh, the, the MEA's response. There are, there, are, there are very important diplomatic questions here. But Captain D.K. Sharma, do you want to add the military voice here? Yes, yes, yes. Good evening, sirs. Uh, two things. First is piracy and the other is Israel-Hamas war. One has to be very clear. Israel-Hamas war, the Houthis are state-backed. They are hitting. They are looking for disruptions. They are looking for making trade difficult. Anti-piracy, they are looking for vessels of opportunity. They are looking for that one chance in which they can go and ask for ransom. So these are two different things. Piracy may be, as Admiral has brought out, being controlled by mafias, drug running, and other things. But connecting these two things, uh, Barkha, this has been happening since 2008. Indian Navy has dedicated efforts since 2008. And if you ask me, more than 100 ships have spent more than 15 years over there just convoying the cargo or Indian flagship or otherwise. And we have made an internationally recognized transit corridor, which is 500 nautical miles long, which is 1,000 kilometers, which means the ships coming out of the Suez from Red Sea to Gulf of Aden, they are escorted and they are brought out of the Gulf of Aden. And similarly, the ships which are coming from Southeast Asia, rounding India and then entering into the Gulf are escorted from this end. So also, this is, I'm talking about the Gulf of Aden, Babel Mandeb and Suez Canal. On the top, in the Persian Gulf, since 2019, there was an attack on two ships. From that day onwards till today, Indian Navy has dedicated more than 30 ships. On an average, six ships daily are being escorted in and out because the world's energy needs are being met from there. So connecting and saying that this, this is because of this, no, both the things are separate. Probably the pirates are taking advantage. So you don't think this is connected to the larger uh, 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 sort of uh, geopolitical churn that is taking place? It, but might, at the same be, it time... might be intertwined. It might be intertwined, but the piracy thing has been there and it has not gone anywhere. India okay. has been, you know, working okay, on Okay, so let's, let's park that thought. So at the moment, we don't fully agree. Was this a case of piracy? Is this a case of terror? Are the two intersecting? But the important thing that you mentioned is that the Houthis are state-backed. And I want uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar at this point to come in. But before you do so, sir, I want to just play out a statement from the Foreign Ministry. The Foreign Ministry talking about how India would not be part of a US-led coalition in these waters. So India's warships, uh, missile uh, uh, destroyers have been deployed independently of any international coalition. Now I want you to listen in and then I have a couple of questions. Take a look. That we attach very high importance to freedom of navigation, free movement of commercial shipping. We are looking at the situation. We are. It's an evolving situation and we are looking at all aspects of it. As you know, we have Indian Navy ships patrolling the area. They're also keeping a watch on Indian ships there. Uh, uh, so far, we are not part of any multilateral initiative or project in the, in the area. Uh, uh, so that is where we are. But we are looking at the unfolding situation very closely. Ambassador Mohan Kumar, this was reported as India snubs, quote unquote, in the media. India snubs US's appeal to be part of this uh, multilateral coalition. The ministry has made it clear that so far, we're not planning to do this. If I remember correctly, the last time we were on this program discussing this, you said, we can't do this alone. Are we alone? The rescue operation certainly has been carried off alone. Uh, and there was a, a heated debate uh, after your comments. Uh, you seem to imply we need help, we need support, we need allies. Now, the foreign ministry says we're not part of any multilateral coalition. Should we be? So, thank you very much. Uh, I think I want to begin by saying with due respect to everybody that it is the, it is geopolitics stupid. That's, that's my assessment as far as the yes. point on geopolitics is concerned, but perhaps I'm biased. Um, I, the, on, the, on the other statement by the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs, the operational words, Barkha, are so far. I don't think he has ruled it out at all, and he yeah. should not. 
Yeah. I want to I want to begin by saying we have taken a big decision in the last one and a half years to join what is known as the Combined Maritime Forces stationed in Bahrain as part of the Fifth Fleet. This Combined Maritime Forces does not include China. It does not include Russia. And most importantly, it does not include Iran. So in a manner of speaking, we've already taken sides, in my view. And this was an important decision we made. I think there are two issues, which is why I stick to my earlier uh, I mean, statement, which I made on your show, that I don't think we can do this alone. There is an area problem and there is a cost problem. The area problem is as long as you are dealing with distress calls from ships on which Indian crew is stranded and you will get it through the information fusion center in Gurgaon, you can respond to it to the best of your ability. This is what you have done. I would be I would be uh, I would say that it would be wrong to say that we are capable of absolutely ensuring unimpeded maritime traffic over thousands of kilometers of sea lanes. I do not, I still do not believe we do not have the capacity to do that. The combined maritime forces allows you to operate on a voluntary basis. So we have done it so far. But if the Houthis and the Somali pirates coordinate, and if there is an intensified attack, I'm afraid India will have to work on those two words. So far, we have not been part of a multilateral coalition. Should we be? There's also a cost problem because for the Houthis, it is hundred dollars a drone to shoot them down. You, it, it's several thousands of dollars. So there is a cost asymmetry problem. So, so I think I would say that for the time being, this is fine. We can. Uh, we certainly are doing this on our own. Unless you have tremendous coordination and earmark zones in which India will ensure earmark zones which in which the United States and its allies will do. And I want to conclude by saying that even countries like France, Italy have not uh, uh, taken a decision to be part of the multilateral coalition. So we will have to wait and see. I think we are best uh, suited to confine ourselves to zones where Indian ships or ships which have Indian crew are in distress and we can respond to them. That is more of a first responder kind of thing. We are not yet doing what is known as providing net security in the Indian Ocean. That's a big expression because you'll have to cover the whole sea lanes of communication. So far, you're doing first responder and you're doing and you're making a damn good I, I, job. Are you are you actually saying because because this has been quite provocative and I want to open it up? Are you actually saying that if there were not Indian crew on this particular hijacked ship, India's scope for intervention would have been limited? No, I'm 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 just saying that uh, we would have let the Americans do it. Why would we do it unless we have a stake in a ship which either has got cargo destined for India yeah. or has got uh, you know crew members on it? and from which we get distress calls, I don't see why we should stick our neck out for the time being. But there may come a time when the whole place is up in flames. I don't think we are there yet. But if we do, then we will have to take a call is what I'm saying. Okay, I can see a lot of uh, agitated, uh, as, as capable as military veterans are of showing agitation, uh, eagerness, I would say, uh, of wanting to come in. I'll start with uh, uh, Admiral Ghormade and then I'll come to Captain DK Sharma. Uh, sir, please go ahead, Admiral. Yeah, I, uh, what I agree with Ambassador is that it is the question of area. I think the uh, US uh, prosperity guardian is for Red Sea. And we should understand the importance and the location in Red Sea and the Al uh, Houdadi, the port on the northwestern of Yemen, from where the attack of you, uh, Houthis is happening. Yes. At any moment, there are 250 ships in Red Sea. So the logistics is daunting and therefore to control that is a major action. So in that case, I think India has taken a correct stand that we will not be part of a multilateral coalition at present, but it's always open. I think uh, our country, we have, been, we have been very flexible. The question most important is 
that we have been we are committed to safety of seafarers in the ocean it's not only indian crew indian navy has always escorted any ship in uh, in danger or uh, in distress and therefore we first commit whoever it is it is not that we will respond we will respond to anyone it is not only indians first but but when but when the ambassador the, says indian admiral India, admiral when the ambassador says says that the area and the costs the area and the cost is daunting and we cannot do this alone and maybe we're not joining a coalition yet but we've got to leave the door open for this would you agree yes we leave, we leave the door open that is correct and okay. all, at all times we are actually uh, exchanging information with all maritime agencies the ifc ior is one uh, place where we exchange information the uk mto portal information comes to us we know in what is happening all around and that is how we are able to respond and the closest ship actually responds we the closest warship will respond so if we are the closest we will respond it will not that key it has to be an indian crew but when okay. there are indian crew we have much more commitment obviously obviously, that, obviously. Uh, national interest okay captain dikesh sharma i saw you uh, disagreeing with the ambassador uh, go ahead uh, most respectfully sir i will tell you that am i audible yeah. okay sir the point is at sea there are some standard operating procedures and as admiral was bringing out in the opening remarks that once you are going inside the citadel that means once you sell that there is a problem you are sending out distress signals and thereafter you have to go into citadel and the ship which is closest and everybody knows it sir on the open frequency you are getting the position of the ship and the distress signal is coming to you everybody plots it and sees whether i am 100 miles 200 miles and ifc ior is giving you the information uk mto is giving you the information so as a norm as a standard operating procedure the ship closest will increase the speed and head towards that it is first the distress ship has to be attended to the nationality of the crew and what flag it is flying is a different thing sir all of us have to work together otherwise this problem cannot be solved and there are very okay. very clear uh, you know uh, procedures at sea that who will respond how it will be respond and when the responsibility will be you know handed over to somebody else got, got, the first got it. responsibility will be by the closest person. okay got it uh, dr mohan kumar briefly and then i want to come to admiral sinha and general hasnan briefly sir dr kumar can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I didn't listen to your. I couldn't hear your question. No, I was just saying if you want to respond to that briefly, and then I'll come to the others. Uh, no, I, no, I, I agree with him. If there, I, I'm not suggesting that the, if there is an Indian destroyer which is nearby and we get a distress call and other things remaining the same, of course we would go to help. I, I have no problem with that. I am merely anticipating Barka in the future. If there is a wider conflagration might be just a wee bit difficult for India to say that, listen, we will only bother about a few zones or few kilometers of a zone and then leave the rest. Because you have, what you have to understand is these are, uh, this is a kinetic scenario. The ship is moving from one zone to the other. It's not as if a ship is just stationary, right? And it's got cargo. And as somebody said, 250 ships in one zone. That's a hell of a lot for the Indian naval assets to deal with. That's all I'm saying. And I think a time will come, come, I think, when you will simply have to join forces, at least earmark zones, the limited okay. zones where you will have to take responsibility. Okay, Admiral Sira, let's bring you in, uh, if I can, at this point. Uh, you know, the fact is that we are already in an expanded theater of conflict after the Israel-Hamas uh, collision, the Israel uh, uh, sort of... Uh, war against uh, Gaza to take out Hamas. We have seen Hamas uh, leadership being taken out in uh, in Lebanon. Uh, we are seeing an escalatory uh, uh, sort of rising tensions, an escalatory ladder moving up quite fast between the United States and Iran. Uh, we, are, we have our own independent relations with Iran, but Captain D.K. Sharma made the important point. The Houthis are not terror groups without a state. 
you're actually talking about a state backed terror in which india will come under pressure to take sides now dr kumar says we've already taken a side do you agree uh very much let me <clears throat> go back to two incidents one is in 2007 the then uh, cno of the us navy admiral mike mullen he was in india and he was walking with me on the deck of ins virat i was fleet commander at the time and he mentioned that to ensure maritime security in the world you require thousand ship navy so i quite agree with uh, uh, you know ambassador mon kumar that you know that kind of effort and let me tell you even that that in spite of china having overtaken uh, uh, america world still hasn't reached thousand ship number so there you are you know obviously then you require coordination at sea is absolutely germane to operations alone no country can do it absolutely right in fact i will give you another example you know when the piracy was at it uh, at, at speak in the red sea and somali land there were only two sh- warships at any time indian ship and the chinese ship and these warships were talking to each other they used to form the convoy of ships which were coming out of red sea out of the suez canal and they were escorted in front by one ship and behind by another ship between these two countries and they did that for many years many months so cooperating and coordinating at sea is not something new there are open channels on which you talk to the other ship and you do that in fact let me also tell you this costco may be having a liberian flag but it is a chinese company costco is a chinese company there was no chinese ship there so Interesting. you know the point is that cooperation to, and acting together at sea it is not a only warship related it is for all seafarers and therefore saving life of people you know seafarers it will happen if it, if we get then there obviously there will be some more talk with the united states of america so how are you going to handle it we don't wish to get sucked into this those diplomatic you know provisions will be made i'm sure but only as a safety i think that cooperating with another country whether you call it a coalition you call it cooperation we have no coalition with chinese chinese naval ships and indian naval ships have been doing this so, up and down so, 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 so to that extent you agree you agree that in real terms we do need to be allied with a coalition well no not allied we we use a if we are cooperating with them you know at sea you may okay, not have what about being like, part of one what about being part of a coalition well we have we already announced to... we have already announced that we are part of that coalition force but no, that I mean, coalition force Americans... at the moment only in the persian gulf it's not that's here. right that's right and the americans have asked us general hasnain and we have said so far we are not part of this go ahead general hasnain see barkha i am a land lover in this world of seafarers <laughs> right but i have a lot to say on these things yes. number one uh, i disagree with captain sharma completely on this aspect the he seems to consider that this is all naval operations I'm sorry this is hybrid war not naval operations this is hybrid war of a different kind which is entering into the seas and you have to understand this from a larger angle i have a tremendous experience on handling this right yeah in a hybrid war you don't you don't start responding in a military way immediately that is why i i said right in the beginning this is geopolitics This yeah. is geopolitics being played out. This is a tremendous. I fully agreed with Admiral Sena on this particular aspect that there are there are networks and networks existing here. I disagree on the fact that the Houthis are only state backed. The Houthis are very much in league with many many non-state actors in all around the region, with the with with the Al Shabab, with the ISIS, many of them. Although ISIS, is, of course, disagrees completely with Iran. But in this world of terror, you don't know who is who's. So explain that. So explain that. So I'm trying to explain. Can, to can, can I ask you a question, General Hassan? Can I ask you a yeah, question? Yeah, Because I'm yeah. conf- I'm confused. Yeah. The Houthis, you say, are in league with a range of non-state actors, including the Islamic State. The blast in Iran that has taken place just now, just recently, killing It's more ISIS. than a hundred people. The ISIS takes responsibility for this. How do we make sense of these sort of? interconnected terror network seemingly contradictory they barka don't try and segmentize this into clean 
you know, in, you know into, into cubes as such. These are right. all spilling over into each other at all times, which is why the world remains confused on a hybrid war always. This is one of the characteristics of hybrid war. Hybrid war is today known as gray zone war, well, virtually. No longer hybrid war. So the grayness is all there. You may be allied with him and against the same person also simultaneously. So and that is irrelevant at the moment. What I'm trying to also say is, let's go back to certain examples which may be relevant. You remember in Somalia, did the Indian army agree to, uh, to operate in Somalia? No, it did not. Until the United States left, we worked only under the UN flag. We said we will not work under the US flag. You try and draw, draw that analogy here now. You say, we will enter into a coalition on our own terms. Yeah. I think we are playing for time at the moment. We are very much, it's in our interest to be a part of the coalition. Very much. We don't want to work under anyone's flag. We want the sponsorship to be primarily that of an international institution such as the United Nations. India is the first to jump into anything in which the United Nations has a sponsorship. I think so that's consider a great it point. from that angle. Consider it yeah. from that yeah. angle. We are playing diplomacy at the moment, very correctly, as Ambassador Monkumar says. We are working out diplomatically to come to a situation where we enter into this on our terms. And uh, Ambassador Kumar and then Captain DK Sharma, and then I'll come to the two admirals. I think that's a great point, Bajan Hussain, that we as a country do not want to be under another country's flag. Now, if this was a UN led multilateral coalition, I think the response may have been very different, may have been much swifter. I I'm, I tend to agree with it. Uh, that's that's absolutely correct. But more than any reservation um, about being part of an American coalition, and I think that reservation has also changed over time. You understand, of course, that we are now into a very serious strategic partnership with the US. I would, I, would, I would be inclined to think there would be lesser resistance than when we operated in Somalia and so on. I think the, the issue, frankly, and I'm going to, you know, sometimes I think I, you bring out the most provocative part of my, <laughs> but let me, let me spell it out. I think the problem really is Iran, frankly. We have a civilizational relationship with Iran. We've got Chabahar, we've got the rest yeah. of it. I don't think the issue is United States so much as supposing this becomes really an American Iran kind of situation, which it can easily become, then I think we wouldn't want to be caught in the crossfire. So that is really the problem, I think. It's not so much uh, being part of the US. After all, I keep saying this, Barkha, but the combined maritime forces is actually led by the United States. The fifth fleet in Bahrain, I was ambassador there for four and a half years. We are now a member of the combined maritime forces. So I don't think that's such an issue. The issue is Iran, frankly, yeah, because we I know the kind of support Iran gives to Houthis. And if, if that were to come into play, and if that becomes a wider conflagration and this becomes a a regional issue, then I think it would be a real problem for India because you appreciate, of course, we've got over 8 million people in the Gulf states working. We get a lot of oil from them. We've yeah. got important we've got important projects now like the India Middle East Economic Corridor, Europe Economic Corridor. After a lot of time, we have excellent ties with UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, if UAE and Saudi Arabia join the coalition, I actually think we will do it the day after. No issue at all. That is more the issue. It's not so much the US, but thank you. Very interesting. So General Hassan says not under an American flag. Ambassador Kumar says the American flag isn't the issue. It's that you can't alienate Iran. Uh, you have interests in uh, West Asia, Middle East, call it what you will, in the Gulf. Uh, and we'll come to that in a moment. But Captain DK Sharma, to your point about this being piracy, that we've seen this before. Uh, all, you're, you're, you're on your own on that one, on this panel at least. And so I have to give you a chance to respond. Captain DKS. You see, first of all, I didn't say that Houthis are not in uh, touch with the other terror groups. I said they are also state packed. What weaponry they are using, it cannot come from open market. They are certainly getting supplied. Number two, if the attacks which we are talking about which happened on our ship in the middle of Arabian Sea, if the coordinates of that ship have been given, from where did they come? Do the Houthis have operations rooms? No, they do not have. So the point is, they are directly, indirectly involved somehow or the other. 
Who is that state? I don't know. Number three, Varkha, everybody is talking about areas. It is so clear that the coalition forces are inside where the density of the ships is much higher, where you need too much of ammunition to you know, neutralize the threats which are coming out. And the moment the area is increasing, I mean, say, when you are opening out into the Arabian Sea, there is no other Navy except Indian Navy. Five ships, long-range maritime aircraft, predator, sea guardians, you name it, everything is there. Uh, we have put such a solid deterrent patrol, and I would like to assure the panel, whatever little knowledge I've got, and I've got two admirals with me, Indian Navy is very much capable. I can give you in writing that if the ship comes out of Gulf of Aden, and it is being tracked by the IFC IOR, and it is being tracked by the UK MTO. Nobody can touch it because we have got that okay. kind of surveillance assets now. And Barka, and we started in 2008 when we didn't have these assets. We I have understand. the Concordia class destroyers. We have the P8Is. We have the Predators. We have the Sea Guardians. We have the MH60R. There is such a formidable Navy now that it is no more the Navy of 2008 when we started and we were struggling. Today, my Navy and all the navies of the world are looking forward to exercise with you, learn the best practices, and I that is why in the Indo-Pacific, the whole of the IOR is with us. Okay. I want to bring in the admirals now on the larger question. And again, Captain D.K. Sharma, I think the country is proud of, of, of the Indian Navy and the Marcos, so the daring rescue. And that there is no debate. There are no two opinions about that. I think what Dr. Kumar, uh, Mohan Kumar uh, zooms in on, um, Admiral Gohormande, to you first. Uh, can we take a side in a regional war that what we're actually seeing on the high seas can no longer be called piracy, can no longer be called the protection of seafarers? You are actually seeing, as we saw in that dramatic video, and we look at it once more, the Houthis detonating, uh, 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 you know, a drone on the waters backed by state actors in alliance with non-state actors. And as Ambassador Dr. Mohan Kumar says, the issue is Iran. This is a group that is Iran aligned. US Iran tensions are getting worse. Admiral uh, Ghormade, to you first. Yeah. Uh, no, this is a really a big picture and uh, it is a geopolitical problem. The piracy is not one off event. And why I tell you? Because from 2008 also, we had realized very clearly that uh, the solution to piracy was not at, this, at sea. The solution and the problem lied in the land. Uh, the yes. whole issue was emerging from there. And similarly, the present situation also is not just one off event. And therefore, it's a larger and bigger picture. So therefore, India will take a very calculated stand in this particular state. We have always maintained, like General Hasnain brought out, that we will be under a UN coalition. We don't want to be the same. Now, I don't want to say that doesn't mean we will not uh, we with the US or we will not be with the thing. You, you have to be very, very, I think the diplomacy plays very well in that. Uh, so we have to take a very, very calculated decision. We have to do what is best in our interest. See, we have the forces. We are Indian Navy is the regional stabilizing force in the Indian Ocean. I think that is where every advanced Navy, even the US Navy looks at Indian Navy to support. All navies want to be seen with the Indian Navy yeah. because we are a force to reckon with and we provide the stability and the balance. And therefore, we will be very, very careful to take stands in, in particular regional war. That yeah. I think we should be very clear. We should stand in such a way that we can support our seafarers, seafarers and all the international community. So therefore, yeah. uh, we need to be very, very and, careful. And, and, on that. Uh, that's a, that's that's. True, and I think that is how India responds as a state. But uh, Admiral uh, Sinha, Ambassador Kumar says India is changing. This is not the India of 2008. We have a very deep strategic alliance with the Americans. And if perhaps in this coalition there was UAE and the Saudis, that's what you said, Ambassador Kumar, our response might be different. Do you, do you agree? Admiral Sinha? See, I want to make a point very clear that, yeah. you know, we are in the quad with the Americans. Yeah. And yet, and yet, we are buying oil from Russia. They yes. have not, uh, you know, thrown us out of the quad. 
So the reason of being with America is very different. It's a big geopolitical reason. If that push comes to shove, and I will go back to what Ambassador Mohan Kumar said in the beginning, Indian Navy will prioritize, with Vice Chief has also mentioned, we will prioritize if it is a full-scale war, then obviously it will be Indian flagships with the Indian crew or the cargo destined for India or going away from India. So yeah. that will take priority. And this will be worked out very much diplomatically. And it will be best to have a UN flag and choose the countries in that group as to who will be responsible for which kind of attack in which zone. So this is, you know, we, are, we are looking at very full-scale war, which is a very, very remote possibility at sea. What are you expecting? What are you expecting? Let me ask you. What are you expecting? Yeah, yeah. I, so. I, I want to tell you one more thing, Barkha. I go back to what General Hasnayan said. In my my sense, my belief, there are no non-state actors in the world. Okay, every non-state actor has the backing of a state, and therefore they are not non-state actors. Otherwise, they will not have power that the kind of power they will let's see the land over and they do over land. I mean, look, they are all interconnected. And as the Admiral Gormati rightly says, you know, the trouble is on land. It is not at sea. Sea is only a manifestation. And hybrid yeah. war, I mean, absolutely. You create yeah. trouble at sea to sort out something over land. And this is exactly it's economic warfare, really. Yeah, I think that's a really perceptive comment. And before I give General Hasnain the last word, Ambassador Kumar, since you, in a sense, generated this debate, uh, pick up Admiral Sinha's point about there are no non-state actors. Now, if there are no non-state actors, then any response that comes from India is actually taking a side in a hybrid war, which has now entered the waters. Ambassador Kumar? Uh, to some extent, yes. But, you know, uh, I mean, uh, there are fragile states, uh, Barkha. So I would like to nuance that statement a little bit. You know, the, the Yemen is such a fragile state True. and the Houthis control two-thirds of Yemen. So to that extent, you can say, okay, Houthis are operating from Yemen and, and Yemen is a state, obviously. So in that sense, they are not a non-state actor. But I, I just want to conclude by saying that I think the geopolitical situation is uh, advancing um, rapidly. And I agree with those who have said what is happening in the Red Sea or the, the Arabian Sea is actually a manifestation of what is happening in the Middle East. In, in another program in which you were kind enough to invite me, I said that the Middle East produces more geopolitics than it can consume. And what <laughs> stays in the and what happens in the Middle East seldom stays there. And I, I would like to see this as vindication of those two statements, Barka. Thank you. That is correct. Uh, uh, just just the opposite of Vegas. Uh, General Hasnain, uh, let me give you give you the last word there. That that the Middle East ripple effect uh, is now you know it's it's being felt all over the world, including in the Indian backwaters. I use that backwaters as a metaphor. Uh, go ahead, um, General Hasnain. Thank you. Uh, I never expected that this program will turn out to be so interesting. I was, <laughs> I, I, I was just wondering what the hell am I going to be doing out there in this program. But I realize now as a land lover, there is a tremendous connect between the land and the sea. And uh, uh, therefore, this whole business, you see, if, if we should look at this as a continuum from the Red Sea to Afghanistan. This whole area needs to be analyzed as a, in, a, in a wholesome kind of a way. There are segments and demarcations all along, but each of them connect up with each other. Uh, I was in a couple of programs in the last two days on television. And interestingly, the Indian media is, is getting it all right. They are picking up all the finer nuances here and there. Something which I've been speaking over the last two years, that there's an inevitable second cycle of global terror, which will come, which will get triggered by a major event in the Middle East. That's coming true. And the Indian media is picking it up marvelously and analyzing it. Having said that, I will disagree slightly with Admiral Sana. Oh. Non-state actors are also definitely non-state today. For example, Boko Haram. ISIS, Al-Shabaab, you won't find too many takers around the world who will actually be supporting them. If you think that it's Iran who's doing it, no, Iran's ideology is completely different. But there may be some stakeholders within Iran who support them. It can happen from Saudi. Saudi as a state will never support all this. But there are elements within Saudi Arabia which will do it. So this is again one of those areas of grey zone where you cannot have demarcations. And we should never imagine that... Uh, non-state actors are now all become state actors as such. My, my last point, 
I think this was a very interesting issue about the UAE and Saudi Arabia joining in. Mm. I think we are playing for time. India is correctly and diplomatically playing for time. The most suitable way would be to have an effective coalition, have states with whom we have already got an understanding. And I think with the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, we have almost special relationships today. And therefore, if they come on board and some other nations join in, I see the beginnings of a very, very effective uh, naval coalition uh, in this particular zone of hybrid war. Okay, we leave it. We we leave it there. But I think we can all agree uh, on one thing that we are seeing uh, the beginnings of a second global cycle of terror. Uh, we are seeing a, a continuum. This is not Israel and Gaza in isolation. It's not U.S. and Iran. It's not Lebanon and uh, and and Israel. It is there is an interconnectedness between terror networks and an interconnectedness between nations. And I think India is uh, walking the tightrope, but even so, as the Navy uh, described the situation, is fully mission deployed with warships, destroyers, and aircraft uh, on the high seas. We leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much to, uh, to Admirals Ghormade and Sinha, to Captain D.K. Sharma, General Hasnain, and Dr. Ambassador Mohan Kumar. Thank you very much. A pleasure. And to our audience, have a great weekend and see you soon. Mojo Story has always made a commitment to its viewers to go to where the story is. And as you can see here, we are at the epicenter of the Israel war on Gaza. We are right at the front line, about one mile from the Gaza Strip, as is the Israeli military gets ready with its tanks and its gunners to begin its final frontal assault that will take troops into Gaza. As we said, we are not like other organizations. We believe in giving you all sides of the story objectively and as much as possible from the ground. And that's exactly what we're doing here, covering the biggest global story today from the epicenter of the war zone. So please, we need your support. Support us, become a Mojo member, subscribe to us, spread the word and thank you for your support.